effectively to the biggest financial crisis in a century. And it leaves the Bank of England well placed to address a range of developments, possible developments around Brexit. Now, in the past 20 years, we've also learned a few lessons, and I'm going to highlight three before closing. The first is that the financial crisis exposed how a healthy focus on price stability could become a dangerous distraction. Central banks won the war against inflation during the Great Moderation, only to lose the peace as vulnerabilities built inexorably. Now, monetary policy is not best placed to address the risk to financial stability. But the challenge is that the necessary financial policy decisions are also subject to time inconsistency. Financial lobbies are strong, and the temptations of a dash for growth powerful. Conversely, there are no obvious or immediate rewards to taking tough decisions that are necessary to avoid a future crisis. In the world of financial stability, success is an orphan. And that's why when the Bank of England was fundamentally reformed after the crisis, the procedures and structures of the MPC were largely replicated in the bank's two new committees, the FPC and the PRC. Crucially, all of the bank committees have access to all of the bank's information and analysis. They're all well informed about each other's reaction functions, and they can all coordinate their policies if it's appropriate. The Bank of England's committees are independent, but they're not isolated. The second lesson of the past two decades has been the importance of flexibility in flexible inflation targeting. So while the inflation target applies at all times, our remit has always acknowledged that inflation may deviate temporarily from target on account of shocks. And since 2013, the remit has explicitly recognized that in exceptional circumstances, bringing inflation back to target too rapidly could cause undesirable volatility in output and employment. In exceptional circumstances such as today, when the economy is facing profound structural change, the MPC can extend the horizon over which it returns inflation to target from above in order to balance the effect on jobs and activity. After all, even though monetary policy can, cannot prevent the weaker real income growth that's likely to accompany the transition to new trading arrangements with the EU, it can influence how this hit to incomes is distributed between job losses and price rises. And this brings me to my final point. Well, carefully circumscribed independence is highly effective in delivering both price and financial stability. It can't deliver lasting prosperity, and it cannot solve broader societal challenges. This bears emphasizing because in recent years, a host of issues have been laid at the door of the Bank of England, from housing affordability to poor productivity. Calls for the bank to solve these challenges ignore our carefully defined objectives, and they confuse independence with omnipotence. Monetary and financial stability are foundational. They're necessary for prosperity, but they aren't sufficient to deliver it. The biggest determinants of the UK's medium-term prosperity will be the country's new relationship with the EU and the series of reforms that that relationship catalyzes. Most of the necessary adjustments are real in nature and therefore not in the gift of monetary policy makers. But the bank will do everything it can to support the adjustment consistent with its statutory obligations. We'll continue to assess and express our independent assessment of the risks associated with Brexit. We'll use all our powers, consistent with our remits, to mitigate those risks and to smooth the adjustment to new opportunities. Monetary policy will continue to be set to achieve the inflation target in a way that helps smooth real adjustment and supports jobs in the wake of very large external forces. We'll make sure that banks are capitalized so they can withstand any severe shock, however unlikely, uh, any severe shock that could be associated with Brexit and still be able to meet the demands of households and businesses for credit. The financial system as a whole will have the capacity to finance the transition 
and to seize the opportunities uh, that come beyond. And these are the best contributions that the Bank of England can make to the good of the people of the United Kingdom. So ultimately, the prosperity of the UK will reflect not just the final Brexit arrangements, but also the government's broader fiscal and structural policies. And the first speaker at this conference is best placed uh, to address these topics. Now, it could have been very different. As some of you know, the Prime Minister began her career as a new graduate at the Bank of England before leaving after six years to pursue other interests, ultimately politics. Whilst at the bank, the Prime Minister worked in our economic intelligence department, the cutting edge then of our activities. And during her time, she accomplished uh, many great things and was destined for much more. Just imagine, Prime Minister, what could have become of your career if you'd stayed. <laughs> you, could have, you could have been here in Fishmonger's Hall introducing yourself. Um, uh, but instead, you've, you've come here uh, by a road less traveled. Theresa May was elected MP for Maidenhead in 1997, just as the bank was getting to grips with its newfound independence. She held a number of positions in the shadow cabinets of a string of opposition leaders and served as chair of the Conservative Party. After the formation of the coalition government in 2010, she would become the longest serving Home Secretary in over 60 years, during a period where she confronted many of society's biggest challenges, for example, introducing legislation to tackle domestic violence, to eradicate modern slavery, and to counter terrorism. Never afraid of a challenge, she stepped into the breach to become Prime Minister following the referendum. The Prime Minister and her government are committed to making the most of the opportunities that Brexit brings, and more fundamentally, to working to build a stronger, fairer, and more prosperous country for all. So please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for that introduction. And as one who you just heard began her professional life at the Bank of England some 40 years ago, it's a great pleasure to address this conference today. Uh, your reference to uh, where I worked in the bank reminded me that when I applied to the Bank of England as a geography graduate, when the application form asked which part of the bank I'd like to work in, I put the international department. So I thought geography graduate, that would fit. So the Bank of England chose to put me into economic intelligence. When I first started working for the bank back in 1977, it was a very different institution from the one we see today. Central banking then was a profession shrouded in secrecy. I think the spirit of that time is captured in a story which the former governor, Mervyn King, tells. When Lord King first joined the Bank of England, he asked Paul, Paul Volcker, the eminent chairman of the Federal Reserve under Presidents Carter and Reagan, what quality a central banker should seek to embody. Mystique, was his reply. Much has changed in the years since, and for the better. You, Governor, have contributed to that improvement through the reforms you have led at the Bank of England. Today, openness and transparency are defining characteristics of a modern central bank. And this conference celebrates an important milestone in the evolution of this institution, the granting of operational independence. The newly elected Labour government decided shortly after the 1997 general election that they would do what successive governors and indeed some Conservative chancellors had long talked about, give the bank responsibility for setting the official short-term interest rate. As a newly elected MP at that time, I remember those debates well and looking back on them now after 20 years in which independent monetary policy making has become the norm around the world, the disagreements which then divided the House of Commons on the issue seem rather academic. The successful adoption of inflation targeting in 1992 had already taken much of the political heat out of rate setting. And fears that the absence of a formal dual mandate to protect employment as well as target inflation might put jobs at risk have proved unfounded. And I would like to pay tribute to you, Governor, to your predecessors, Lord King of Lothbury and the late Lord George, and to all the members who have served on the Monetary Policy Committee over the last two decades. You have been a dedicated group of public servants, motivated to serve the public interest and to discharge the responsibility which Parliament has given you to the best of your ability. 
and there is much to be proud of over the last 20 years. Whatever the debates at the time, there was never any real disagreement about what the central aim of monetary policy should be, to eliminate the high inflation which had bedeviled the British economy for decades. From the start of inflation targeting in 1992 and operational independence in 1997, that is what the bank has helped to achieve. As it has in other countries, central bank independence has helped improve credibility and accountability, has successfully anchored inflation expectations and has contributed to low and stable inflation. The results have been impressive. Since independence, UK inflation has been much more stable than it was in the previous 20 years, when it fluctuated from 1% to 22%. We know that high inflation hurts ordinary people, and that low and stable inflation benefits households and businesses. The fact that inflation of 22% sounds outlandish to us today is a tribute to your success. But as we reflect on the undoubted successes of the last 20 years, we cannot do so with any complacency. Yes, inflation targeting and operational independence contributed to a period of steady growth, low and stable inflation, and general expansion in the year, 10 years after 1997. But problems were developing, which would later become apparent during the financial crisis of 2007-2008. The Great Recession which followed that crisis brought some of the most challenging economic times our country has known. The bank was inevitably caught up in the dramatic events of 2007 and 2008. The tripartite regulatory system of which the bank was a part did not prove to be a success. It failed the country during the financial crisis and we've had to live with the consequences of that failure ever since. Our GDP fell by more than 6% as the UK endured our deepest recession since the Second World War. Successive governments have been forced to take difficult decisions to restore the public finances to order, and these have been decisions which no government would ever want to take. The British people, who played no part in causing the financial crisis, have had to make sacrifices in order to return the economy to health and ease the burden of debt on future generations. Real progress has been made over the last seven years. The bank has played its part, using its independent monetary policy tools of interest rates and quantitative easing to support our economy through the crisis and into the recovery. The government has worked to repair our country's finances, and the latest public sector borrowing figures show that the deficit has been reduced by more than two-thirds, from a post-war high of 10% of GDP in 2009-10 to 2.3% of GDP in 2016-17. But in truth, much work remains ahead of us, and for all our progress, we should neither forget nor underestimate the scale of the sacrifices which have been necessary to get us this far. The impact those sacrifices have had on ordinary working people have led some to lose faith in free market capitalism. And globalization, which has brought us a great many benefits, has also brought changes which have contributed to a wider sense that our economy is not working as it should for everyone in our society. These are understandable responses. There are genuine problems with our economy which need to be addressed. But as we do so, we should never forget the immense value and potential of an open, innovative, free market economy which operates with the right rules and regulations. When countries make the transition from closed, restricted, centrally planned economies to open free market policies, the same things happen. Life expectancy increases and infant mortality fails, falls. Absolute poverty shrinks and disposable income grows. Access to education is widened and rates of illiteracy plummet. Participation in cultural life is extended and more people have the chance to contribute. It is in open free market economies that technological breakthroughs are made which transform, improve and save lives. It is in open free market economies that personal freedoms and liberties find their surest protection. A free market economy, operating under the right rules and regulations, is the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. It was the new combination which led societies out of darkness and stagnation and into the light of the modern age. And in essence, it is very simple. It consists of an open marketplace in which everyone is free to participate regulated under the rule of law, 
with personal freedoms, equality and human rights democratically guaranteed, and an accountable government progressively taking the economic taxing the economic activity which the market generates to fund high quality public services which are freely available to all citizens according to need. That is unquestionably the best and indeed the only sustainable means of increasing the living standards of everyone in a country. And we should never forget that raising the living standards and protecting the jobs of ordinary working people is the central aim of all economic policy. Helping each generation to live longer, fuller, more secure lives than the one which went before them. Not serving an abstract doctrine or an ideological concept, but serving the real interests of the British people. And those of us who believe that the interests of the British people are best served through a successful, open, free market economy need to be honest about where it is not currently working or delivering for ordinary working people today. That is why the government is leading a determined programme of wide-reaching economic reform. We've already overhauled our system of banking regulation to put the Bank of England at the centre of the new framework. The Financial Policy Committee protects financial stability through macroprudential regulation. The Prudential Regulation Authority serves as a microprudential re regulator. And the Financial Conduct Authority regulates the conduct of businesses in our vibrant financial sector. We implemented the recommendations of the Independent Commission on Banking and the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, putting in place strict new rules on bank ring fencing and enhancing individual accountability to raise standards. Our economy has made great strides in the last few years, but we know that for too long, too many communities across the United Kingdom have not seen the benefits of economic growth and prosperity. That waste of potential is bad for the areas concerned and bad for our country's wider productivity. The bank has always taken the economic health of our whole UK seriously as your formidable network of local agents based out in the nations and regions of the UK testifies. And through our industrial strategy, the government is playing its part in promoting growth across the whole country. That strategy will help business invest in the latest technologies, earn local areas of excellent international export champions, and support the skills and innovation we need to succeed in the industries of the future. A thriving financial services sector, providing high quality jobs right across the United Kingdom, vital to our future prosperity. That sector benefits from a strong and respected framework of regulation, which incentivizes innovation. And we will work with the sector to ensure the UK remains the world's financial center and the global hub of fintech. Britain now has a record number of people in work and our flexible labor market has contributed to that success. Many people value the flexibility of our system, but that flexibility cannot be one-sided. That's why I commissioned Matthew Taylor to conduct a thorough review into modern employment practices in our economy. His report recommended that all work should be fair and decent with scope for development and fulfillment, and that is an ambition we fully share. Britain has some of the world's very best higher education institutions, researchers and engineers, but we know that our system of technical education leaves too many of our young people without the skills they need to get a job. That holds them back and hurts our economy. So our new T-level qualifications will reverse decades of drift and create a new high-quality vocational equivalent to A-levels. Britain sets the global standard for high-quality corporate governance. International firms are attracted to the UK, in part because of the strengths of our regulatory system. But we know that to stay competitive, we must keep our standards high and ensure that bad examples of corporate governance do not undermine the public's faith in our market economy. So our reforms to corporate governance will give workers and shareholders a stronger voice in the boardroom and ensure that our biggest firms are incentivized to take decisions which are in the right long-term interests of their businesses. These reforms will bring greater transparency, openness and accountability to markets and to the corporate sector. The very same principles that the bank has lived up to in its work through the Monetary Policy Committee. Now some argue that a free market economy is an end in itself and that drawing attention to the downsides is somehow anti-business. Others would use the imbalances which are now apparent as a justification for the total rejection of the free market economy, which has done so much to improve our lives. 
Instead, they advocate ideologically extreme policies, which have long ago been shown to fail, which are failing people today in places like Venezuela. My argument has always been that if you want to preserve and improve a system which has delivered unparalleled benefits, you have to take seriously its faults and do all you can to address them. Not to do so would put everything we have achieved together as a country at risk. It would lead to a wider loss of faith in free markets and risk a return to the failed ideologies of the past, a return to protectionism in international trade and to inflationary policies at home. Far from somehow protecting the poorest and most vulnerable in our society, that outcome would surely hurt them the most. This is a crucial time to address these fundamental economic questions. Last week in Florence, I set out my vision for the new economic partnership I want our country to build with the European Union in the years ahead. That vision is rooted in a belief in a well-regulated, open, free market economy with sound money and stable prices. As I set out, in leaving the EU, the UK will no longer be members of the single market or customs union. That, of course, will mean changes. You cannot have all the benefits of membership of the single market without its obligations. So our task is to find a new framework that allows for a close economic partnership, but which holds those rights and obligations in a new and different balance. In forging that partnership, that new partnership, we start from an unprecedented position. At the point of our exit, we will have exactly the same rules and regulations as the EU, as our EU withdrawal bill will ensure they are carried over into our domestic law. The challenge then is not how to bring our rules and regulations closer together, but what to do when one of us wants to make changes. That fact should give us confidence, and I believe there are further good reasons to be ambitious and optimistic about what lies ahead. The UK is one of the largest economies in the world and EU's biggest export market. Businesses and jobs across the con continent rely on our shared trade. And more fundamentally, we share a common commitment to the principles of an open free market economy, which I referred to earlier. We believe in free trade, in rigorous and fair competition, in strong consumer rights, and in a rejection of protectionism. And whether it's on goods or on services, including the excellent financial services for which the UK has a global reputation, creating needless new barriers to trade between the EU and its biggest market would benefit no one. The UK's financial markets provide support for businesses and consumers right across the EU, reducing the cost of capital and supporting choice and innovation for consumers. It is in neither the EU's nor the UK's interest to see these financial service markets fragment. And that is another reason I am confident we can agree a new partnership that enables us to continue to work together to bring prosperity to all our peoples. And that is a responsibility which democratically elected governments and institutions dedicated to the public good, like the Bank of England, both share, to promote the prosperity of the people we serve. For the Bank of England, strengthened and improved since the financial crisis, that means discharging its responsibilities to keep inflation on target and maintain the wider health and sustainability of the financial sector. For the government, that means stepping up to its role, ensuring that the rules and regulations which define the free market are designed to make it serve the interests of ordinary working people. Success in this mission must be underpinned by a balanced approach to public spending. That means continuing to deal with our debts so that our economy can remain strong and we can protect people's jobs. At the same time, it means investing in our vital public services like schools and hospitals, which our successful management of the economy has made possible. To abandon that balanced approach with unfunded borrowing and significantly higher levels of taxation which da would damage our economy, threaten jobs and hurt working people. It would mean paying even more in debt interest, which already costs us more each year than we spend on schools. Ultimately, it would mean less money for the public services we all rely on. So we can already see in outline the challenges and opportunities which will define the bank's third decade of independence building a new economic partnership with the European Union, which will deliver prosperity for all our people and making the most of the opportunities which Brexit presents. Reforming our economy so that the benefits of a well-regulated free market are felt in all parts of our country and by everyone in our society. And taking a balanced approach to public spending so debt falls as our economy grows and we can invest in the public services on which we all depend. I have no doubt 
that the bank will continue its work to deliver the monetary and financial stability that is essential for a successful economy as we make the most of the opportunities ahead. Governor, I wish you and your distinguished guests well over the next two days as you explore what the future may hold. Thank you. The faults you yourself identified was that the bank's program of ultra low interest rates and QE have had bad side effects, particularly on poor people. What should be done about that? Well, first of all, Barry, I didn't identify that as a fault. What I, the point that I was making was that action that is taken to deal with one uh, issue and was necessary action and yeah. rightly taken by an independent bank um, does have implications for others. Uh, and I was pointing out some of those implications. And of course, what then happens, as we have done, is that it is up to government to look to see what it uh, considers necessary and can do to mitigate any implications which it feels do need to be addressed, such as, for example, the steps we've taken to encourage saving. Because, of course, as we know, low interest rates uh, are good news for borrowers, but not good news for savers. So I think what happens is then for government to look to see whether it should mitigate any of those uh, side effects, any of those implications of the action taken. Excellent. Um, uh, Andy, uh, Verity. Prime Minister, you said you reject protectionism, and you've also made it very clear how unhappy you are with the decision of the Trump administration to impose punitive tariffs on Bombardier. Can you reassure the country's exporters that we're not about to enter a tit-for-tat trade war with a number two export market in the United States? Well, first of all, if I could just comment on the Bombardier issue. Um, this is very important for us in the United Kingdom because of the impact uh, any change would have uh, in relation to jobs in Northern Ireland. Obviously, over 4,000 people employed by Bombardier in Northern Ireland. The judgment that came out of the US Department of Commerce, of course, is a preliminary uh, judgment, a preliminary finding. And I will continue to work uh, uh, with the Canadian Prime Minister, with the Canadian government, and indeed I spoke to both Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill from the DUP and Sinn Féin yesterday about how we can work together to impress on the American government the importance of Bombardier to Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, obviously what I would say in relation to Boeing is that of course we have a long-term partnership with Boeing, various aspects of government, and this is not the sort of behavior you expect from a long-term partner, and it undermines that partnership. Uh, but on the, um, on the wider issue, I think there is a real challenge for us globally today, because I think that there are aspects of protectionism creeping in around the world. I think I have said before I want the UK to be a global champion of free trade, because I think we need to, those of us who believe in free trade, need to stand up and not just explain its wider benefits, but help to explain its benefits to individuals. There are people who feel that globalization has left them behind. We need to ensure our country, our economy is working for everyone, but we also need to show why free trade is so important in raising living standards, in developing gro uh, the growth of economies, in bringing prosperity into our countries. And I think that is uh, a discussion we now need to have because we do see elements of protectionism creeping in around the world. Um, Philip uh, Hildebrand, please. Prime Minister, we're, and many other financial firms, are intensely focused on contributing to responsible finance. One of the ways, one of the many ways we do this is by focusing on hiring from disadvantaged sections of society, hiring from state schools, a deliberate program to push in this direction, which addresses many of the issues you've talked about. But we also need responsible politics. And I guess one of the questions is, you know, to do that, we need to be able to stay here in this great city and in this great country. And so my question would be, 
how can you help us get some certainty that the transition period, which you've outlined, which we all welcome uh, as a likely outcome, that this doesn't lead to simply a longer period of uncertainty of where we end up at the end of the transition period, whether it's two or three or four years. I've noticed you've left some an open window how long that period could be in your speech in Florence. It will be very important that the transition story doesn't simply become an excuse for not knowing what comes at the end of the road. Can you give us any indication of how we can stay in this great city, in this great financial center, and in this great country? Well, we, of course, want to do everything we can to ensure that we continue to see the City of London um, continue to play its role as a global financial center. And we want firms to be able to stay here and continue um, as they have done and, and uh, the contribution that they've made. On the question of the implementation period, and I use the phrase implementation very specifically, because this is a period of time which will be necessary to implement any practical changes that are needed as a result of our exiting the EU and the new partnership that we will have built. And by definition, you could only have that if you know what that end state, what the uh, final partnership is that you're working towards. So the timeline that I see is that we agree what that uh, new deep and special partnership is, we agree what that economic partnership is, obviously there are other issues like security we have to agree as well. Uh, and then that implementation period is there in order to just put those practical changes in place. And some of those will be for government. IT systems may need to change in certain areas, for example. But as I said in my speech in Florence, what's important, I think, is the double lock. And the double lock is, first of all, that you know that that implementation will, period will be there, so there is a period of time to adjust, there's no cliff edge, but secondly, that it will be time limited. We've said around two years, it could be that some aspects of the implementation can be brought forward if there's agreement that that makes sense and it can be done without um, uh, disrupting uh, the process. The idea is to have order and uh, smooth withdrawal, and that's why that implementation period is there, but it will definitely be time limited because we're leaving the EU in March 2019. Okay. Uh, so last question. Against my better judgment, David Marsh. Some of those uh, who go to Berlin quite often, Prime Minister, will have been struck by some resemblances in your speech with which those which could have been made by a federal chancellor. A lot of comments about joint prosperity, common good, ordinary people, talk of rights and obligations, which is a very Germanic kind of phrase. Now, one hears in Berlin that you've got a very good relationship with Chancellor Merkel, and there's strong similarities, as we all know. One also hears that we may get into a few scrapes during this time of the EU negotiations. What emphasis are you going to put on this very strong personal relationship that you have with the German Chancellor to get us out of any fine mess that we might find ourselves in? Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if you were expecting me to say that we might go walking in uh, the uh, Black Forest <laughs> together or something. I'm not, I don't think that's going to be on the cards. Look, I think what's, what's important actually for me as the UK Prime Minister is of course that relationship with the German Chancellor is important but so is the relationship with the other uh, heads of state and, gov of the, uh, 20 and government of the tw 20 other 26 member states of the European Union. Uh, and what I have, uh, will be emphasizing and have emphasized to people, and that, that these are negotiations, and of course there are always ups and downs in negotiations, but what I've emphasized is that what I've set out as that deep and special partnership for the UK with the remaining 27 in the EU uh, is something which I believe is important not just to us but to the EU as well. I don't think this is just a, what's good for the UK, it's actually what's good for Europe collectively because we want to continue to play our part in Europe. We're not leaving Europe, we're leaving the EU. And I think that's one of the elements that I think we, I and David Davis and others around the, uh, the, the cabinet table will be getting across to our opposite numbers, which is that this is something that we believe that end state we've set out will benefit the EU and the UK. Wonderful. Okay, I'm sure this could go on for very long. Thank you, Prime Minister, for opening this uh, conference with uh, substance, with very important messages, both uh, domestically and abroad, and ones that are timeless, uh, particularly for uh, the Bank of England. Uh, so thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prime Minister. I know you have to go on to uh, uh, work on that deep and special partnership that you just referenced. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.